The parables of Jesus are some of the most important teachings in the Bible. Rich, rich teaching. The parable of the soil. So Jesus decided to tell us. So you know, Lord gives many parables. So let's listen carefully and prayerfully and reverently. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you, so let's make the most of this beautiful day since we're together we might as well say would you be mine could you be mine won't you be my neighbor won't you please won't you please please won't you be my neighbor who knew Mr. Rogers was so cool? I mean, I don't know if those were official van sanctioned, but those are pretty cool sneakers for inside the house wear. Um, so I don't even know if this is even a reality. Like, you guys have been part of me growing up the last few weeks in some of these film clips. Like, who really watched? Is there anybody in here that really watched Mr. Rogers? Really watched? Oh, wow. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> So he lasted a lot longer than maybe I thought. Uh, so yeah, I really watched Mr. Rogers along with Captain Kangaroo. Um, if you don't know Captain Kangaroo, that was awesome. Um, YouTube it. I, every morning I had my cream of wheat and Captain Kangaroo and Little Rascals, which is, again, another dated thing um, when I was growing up before I went to school because I caught the bus at 7 o'clock because we kind of lived out in the country and I had to get on the bus because I was on the bus for an hour before I got to school. So crazy stuff, but that was my morning routine. You also saw my college routine, Saturday Night Live, Stuart Smalley. Um, some of you are like, I wish you would have never shown me that clip. I get it. Um, but you just kind of seen part of, you know, what I was exposed to uh, pre the internet. Or I guess the internet was kind of around, but not really. Uh, so that's the way it was. If you've been moving with us, if you've been journeying with us, if you've been participating in what we have been involved in over the last couple of weeks, what we have been involved in is the story of the Good Samaritan. It's the parable that Jesus tells when an expert in the law wants to catch Jesus off guard and he wants to really trap Jesus in this academic debate. And as he asks Jesus this question, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds to him with a question. Go figure. Maybe that's where I get all of my questions. I'm just trying to follow what Jesus is wanting us to do, right? And so Jesus asks a couple of questions, and the questions that he asks of the expert in the law is, well, you tell me. You tell me what the law says. And then he says, and after you tell me what the law says, then you tell me what you think about it. Tell me your interpretation. So the expert in the law doesn't want to look like he's not an expert, and so he answers Jesus. And in answering Jesus, he says, the law says to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so as Jesus engages in, with him in answering that question, he says, hey, you're right. You, you are an expert in the law. You answered that question correctly, and then the expert in the law is kind of panicking because all of a sudden he's trying to trap Jesus in this academic debate and he has just been found out. And so through this discussion, he says, well, Jesus, you know, that was a good question to kind of get things rolling, but, but really, who is my neighbor? And so Jesus then begins to tell a parable speaking about what it means to be defined as a neighbor. 
he actually answers a different question than the expert in the law asks. And we've spent the last two weeks really digesting what is Jesus trying to get the crowd and this lawyer and people who are trying to live through the law and live through faith, what is Jesus trying to get them to understand? And I think the last two weeks we've, we've been on a good journey. I think there's been some good clarity that has come to this parable. But tonight what I want us to focus in on is this, centrifugal love. I haven't had the privilege of actually being in a centrifuge. I think there's some of you that have probably been in a centrifuge where you sit there and the gravity and you get going and you feel the G's that are happening inside that centrifuge. But what does it mean for us to feel the impact of being in the presence of Jesus? And as we're in this presence that Jesus is moving in us, we are feeling the G's of God's presence in our lives that allows us to then engage in the world. You see, what Jesus is trying to get the expert in the law to understand is a deeper concept of love. Now, Mr. Rogers is kind of cheesy. Um, he was a believer, by the way. He's no longer with us, and uh, pretty amazing how he engaged with children. But even in the little bitty tagline of his opening song, he said, I would love for you to be my neighbor. What does it mean for us to love the people around us that they would in fact be our neighbors? Jesus asks the question at the end of this parable, those of you that are just joining us, if you haven't been with us the last two weeks, we're in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Um, if you want to turn there, you can Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And in that passage, Jesus says, who in the story at the end of the parable, he turns back to the lawyer and he says, so who was the neighbor? You've asked me, how do you define neighbor? But what I'm asking you is when I shared this story about a person being beat up and left for dead on the side of the road and then a priest passed by and couldn't be bothered and a Levite passed by and couldn't be bothered, but then guess who? Dun, 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 dun. A Samaritan passed by and actually took care of the wounded man. Who in the story was the neighbor? So the expert replies, and he replies somewhat sheepishly, and he says, the one who cared for the wounded man. Now, as we get more personal into the story, there's some very basic questions to ask of ourselves. And that question is this, who are you? You know, Jesus asked the expert in the law, so who was the neighbor? But now as he looks at us and as we look in the mirror, who are you? Or if we collectively, what I love about the new song that we sang right before this is it talks about the church. Who are we? If Jesus was to look at us after telling this story and ask us that question, who are you? Who are we? Who's representative of you or of us, the church, in this story? You see, our identity is the foundation of understanding neighborly behavior. You see, in order to understand what it means to love our neighbor as ourself, which we already talked about that the first week, that it's not about this cultural self-love, but it's actual, actually about God saying, hey, the way you already take care of yourself, begin to take care of those around you. And because God has injected you with the Holy Spirit and his presence is present in your life, then you're going to have an ability to love them even apart from yourself. But as we look to our identity, the foundation of understanding what it means to be a neighbor is focused on our identity, not the identity of the other guy. You see, oftentimes when we get into these sorts of discussions, we begin to ask the same question that the lawyer asked, but it's not the question that Jesus answered. And it's the question of, well, why should I have to love them? What have they done? Or what have they not done? 
Or if we're more personable, it's like, that person has greatly offended me. That person has wounded me. That person has subjected me to all kinds of abuses. And I don't think I'm exaggerating when I talk about the circumstances of our lives. And when we engage in those types of dialogues and conversations with ourselves or with other people around us, we are asking Jesus the same question that the lawyer asked him. Do I really have to love them? But you see, in answering that question, the focus has to be on us, not the other guy. You see, there's this thing called the gospel. And the gospel is this tremendous story about God's initiative with humanity. That God, knowing that we had fallen and separated ourselves because of our sinful nature, because we chose rebellion as opposed to following according to God's will, he knew that before the foundations of the earth, and he purposed that Jesus, his son, would come to this earth and live a perfect life so that he could be a substitutionary atonement. He could step in our place, in our guilt, so that he could declare us not guilty. That's the gospel. You hear words at Second Mile like justification. And justification is maybe a big churchy theological term, but it just means this. You have been justified. Jesus has stepped in your place and he has said, you will not pay for the penalty that you owe. The consequences for your sin will not pour down on you, but I will take them. So Jesus is saying, you have been justified. The other part of the gospel is not simply the justification of it, but, you know, then it's like, well, I got out of jail free card. Thank you, Jesus, for taking care of me, which, by the way, lots of churches operate that way, but I won't talk to you until I make my way into what I think will be heaven, and ultimately it's not. What does it look like for us to not just have this justified relationship with Jesus, but the next part of the gospel is maybe, well, no part is, is greater than the other, but it's, it's a fusion of what God is doing, and that is the reconciliation part. Not only have we been justified, but we've been reconciled. Jesus has drawn us into a relationship with him. He didn't just pay for our sin, but he wants to sit down over tea or coffee or water or Diet Coke or whatever your beverage of choice is, and he wants to, for you to learn and to understand and to get to know him because the reality is he already knows you. What does it mean for us to take the gospel and to not just be justified, but to also be reconciled. And then the next part of the gospel, they all work together. You cannot separate them from each other. Not only are we justified, not only are we reconciled, but we're also in the process of sanctification. Now, I haven't spent as much time talking about sanctification. I've talked about justification and reconciliation, but this is what sanctification is. You see, it moves us to be declared not guilty, but then we are welcomed with opened arms into a dynamic relationship with Jesus. There's that reconciliation, and here's sanctification. We're propelled in love for God and others by the new power of the Holy Spirit in us. You see, sanctification is the part that this story gets down to, which is, hey, What about my behavior? If I'm going to ask the question about neighborly love, I need to begin to understand what is happening with me. Who am I? Who are we as the church? You see, the the sanctification is the change agent. It's the Holy Spirit in us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's sanctification. 
Jesus has initiated a relationship with us, and as we get to know him, as we are propelled to understand him, then we move and start to change and start to become like him. Our old self is gone and our new self has come. The things that we laughed at before, we no longer laugh at because Jesus wouldn't laugh at those things. The things that we engaged in because we were tired or because we were stressed out, we no longer engage in those things because Jesus is the ultimate satisfaction in our lives. You see, all of us are on this path of knowing and interacting with real people. I don't know if you knew that. But you interact with real people, real people with real lives, full of real stories. And now, when we encounter them with the gospel, they have become a divine call to us. These real people with real lives existing in real places as we come in contact with them, having been rooted in the gospel, having been a workmanship of God, then this encounter has been prepared beforehand for us. You see, these real people with real lives full of real stories are an opportunity. They are a welcomed mandate for us to be who we are in Jesus. Did you catch that? Who we are. When we interact with real people, it exposes who we are, not who they are. So who are you? Who are we? Now, when you read through this, which I'm going to read through it again, you should be familiar with it by now, but We've got to continue to allow the Word of God be the framework of everything that we do. So in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25, I want you to just theorize, and you may have heard this sermon in other places, in other settings. You may know why the priest or the Levite did or did not engage in the wounded guy at the side of the road. And, it, and really, interestingly, interestingly enough, it's not all that important because Jesus kind of just says, hey, they didn't do it, and people kind of expect, oh, I know why they didn't do it. But that's not the importance. The importance is who did. But as we read through the story, just imagine, why didn't they do it? What was revealed about them, not the wounded guy, that, that made them, that forced them to not engage? Starting in verse 25, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to them, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Why? Just imagine it. Just think through what possibly could be the reasons that he did that. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Why? But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Again, why? He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Why? Why? Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The expert says, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. You see, when we interact with real people, engaged in real lives, with real stories, 
And if we are rooted in the gospel, no matter the size or strength of your faith, we come to a crossroads of interaction. And that crossroads of interaction can either paralyze you and you just are there not knowing what to do, can cause you to turn and walk away from the situation, or can cause you to engage in the situation. All of us, no matter where we are, come to that crossroad and think, no matter how fast it goes through our minds, through those three options. We don't know what to do. We're running off because we don't know how on earth we could ever be of any benefit to anything that's going on with that situation. Or we actually stay and engage to one level or another. With real people, in real situations, in real life, that's how we interact. So what does the gospel do? How does the gospel inform us? How does the gospel cause us to act in a way that Jesus is asking us to interact? Well, if we are rooted in the gospel, when we come to that decision, we're not going to be paralyzed by disqualifiers. Let's just be honest. Let's be really honest you're going to be offended at how honest I am. And Angel just went, oh my gosh, I can't believe he just said that. There is no one in this city worthy of my help, including me. Let it sit. There's no one. No one stacks up. No one has a clean slate. I don't deserve your help. Do you know what I've done? Do you know what I've been involved in? Do you know the excuses I make? No one deserves my help. But you see, when we engage with real people in real life, we instantly become paralyzed by disqualifiers. Well, what qualifies this person for me to help them? What disqualifies this person for me to help them? Well, that person's drunk. I'm not giving them money. That person's insane. I'm not going to help them out. That person has been through multiple, multiple, multiple relationships. I've heard it over and over and over again. You think through the excuses. You think through the things that paralyze you. But that's the reality. We sit there and are paralyzed by disqualifying people, but we have to be honest. No one, no one, not even me, is worthy of anyone's help. We're all disqualified. That's how Jesus defines us in need of the gospel. Now, thinking or feeling is not bad as you pause before you move. Hear that. If you are a thinker by nature, you process the world through thoughts, through logic, through Spock-like interactions, then you may get to that point of paralyze, run the other way, engage, and you need to think. It's okay to think. It's not a sin to think. It's okay to take time to pause, to say, am I going to be safe, perhaps? Is this an okay thing to do? There are things that are okay for you to engage, but it shouldn't just automatically disqualify the situation. If you are a feeler, if you process the world through your feelings, guess what? It's okay to feel. It's okay to have a tender moment. It's okay to have a reaction. It's okay to be real in those situations and to allow your circumstances and allow your environment to move you in the way that the Holy Spirit wants you to be moved. But it shouldn't just automatically disqualify that individual from your help. God has made us new creatures in Jesus. And the central issue is how the gospel bears on our own soul. That's what Jesus is trying to get across. The central issue to neighborly love is how the gospel has affected you. How the gospel has affected our church. 
You know, many of us ask this question through various, various seasons of life. When we interact with these real people, with real lives, with real stories, we ask this question, maybe sometimes often, maybe sometimes not so often, but the question is this, should I share the gospel? Should I talk about Jesus? And the question that I would ask you after asking that question surprise, surprise, that I have multiple questions, would be this. Test yourself. Test yourself to see whether or not Jesus is really precious to you. And whether you believe this person is really lost without him. And that it would be the best thing in the world for them to know this, the gospel. Believe this, the gospel. And be redeemed by this, the gospel. Should you share your faith? Test yourself. Do you believe that people should hear the eternal message of freedom that no one deserves, but through God's grace, he's allowed us to hear? Should you share your faith? You see, if you re really believe that it is life changing, eternally altering, absolutely personal, then probably sooner rather than later, you're going to find some way to share with this real person what you know about the gospel. That's what Jesus is trying to get us to understand when he talks about the Samaritan. When the Samaritan is the hero in the story, when the expert in the law is asking Jesus the question, Jesus turns the question back on the lawyer and says, what are you going to do about the gospel? Do you believe that a half-breed Samaritan, a person that kind of shoves your worship experience in your face because they've mixed all kinds of other worship experiences into their culture, do you think they're worth the gospel? So how do we ask ourselves those questions concerning the message of Jesus? I'm going to talk about three things that promotes, that moves us towards radical neighbor love. The first is this. Radical neighbor love magnifies the worth of God, regardless of the cost, and displays the type of love God himself has shown. Notice, that's not a disqualifier. Radical neighbor love magnifies God's worth. Now, that's not to say that when you're out sitting in your front yard, enjoying the beautiful weather of Tucson, watering your flowers, and getting upset because there's aphids on your blooms once again, and you don't want to put chemicals on them, but you can't figure out what else to do, this total hypothetical question, situation, by the way, that when you're in your front yard engaging in that, and you see your neighbor, and your neighbor actually is doing yard work, and they're raking up the leaves from the mesquite that has gone everywhere, in fact, all over the neighborhood, that when you see them try to put those leaves in into the thing that you don't sit first and say, hmm, well, Chad said I should share the gospel, so I need to sit here and think, how am I going to share the gospel with this person before I go help them with their leaves? That's not what you should probably do. You should probably just get up and go help them with their leaves, and then as you go help them with the le their leaves, engage in real conversation, and that real conversation may lead to some truth statements or not, but the fact of the matter is we shouldn't be thinking so hard about life because if the gospel is at the very foundation and is rooted in your love for Jesus, then it should just be part of who you are. You remember those awkward 45 seconds that we experienced some weeks ago when you asked me the question, hey, Chad, why do you love Angel? And I said, well, I need to think about it. And I just let 40 seconds, 45 seconds just go. You remember how awkward that is? You see, it should be a natural part of Angel and I's relationship that I can talk about her, that I can get excited about her, that, that I can talk about her beauty and her love for Jesus and her love for people and all those things. They should just flow right out of my mouth. I don't need 40 seconds. And so when we engage with neighborly love, radical neighborly love, God should be magnified just because God is part of our lives. 
We don't have to pause and think about what we're going to say. Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 and 28, you've heard this out of a Mark passage. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To think about radical neighbor neighbor love, which magnifies the worth of God, regardless of the cost to you, as you look at the example of the Samaritan, it cost him a lot, but God was magnified in that moment. As you think about your life with real people, with real life circumstances, what does it mean for you to engage in that sort of radical neighbor love when it may cost you something? Matthew chapter 9, verses 12 through 13 says this, but when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, if anything, that kind of flips this whole, we try to disqualify people on its head, and if we just really realize that everyone is disqualified, then we can easily engage in every situation. (laughs) Because it's the unrighteous that need our help, not the ones that deserve it. So what does it mean for us to experience radical neighbor love? It means to magnify the worth of God. The second radical neighbor love is this. It's birthed in the soul of one who has tasted the sin-overcoming, mercy-saturating, joy-filling love of God, now manifested in the person of Jesus. Where does this second radical neighbor love come from? It comes from you who has experienced forgiveness. It comes from you who now has been made worthy because of the presence of Jesus in your life. Where does radical neighborly love come from? It comes from your experience with Jesus. 1 John chapter 4 verses 19 through 20 says this. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. If we are to truly embrace neighborly love, then loving the broken is an overflow from the life that has been filled with the love that has been given to us from God. Your life is overflowing into a broken world. Broken world. In order to radically neighborly love, not only do you move to magnify God and not yourself, but then you also can do it because you know what it's like to be forgiven. It's kind of interesting through these different weeks, I've had several different conversations just about that whole topic of forgiveness. And one of the questions was, well, if they continue to just be who they are, does that mean that every single time I have to offer forgiveness, every single time I have to offer forgiveness? And the reality is it's not dependent on them and their choices, but it's dependent on the gospel taking root in you. So if you are at peace with your forgiveness and you're at peace with God is under control, he understands the situations, he's got it taken care of, then you can be in a state of forgiveness despite their actions because you're rooted in the gospel. So how are you doing in this radical neighborly sort of love? The third is this. Radical neighbor love, well, guess what? It's impossible without God. You can't do it. You will constantly qualify someone. You will constantly be measuring them against whatever standard of measurement you have. 
Only when you fully embrace the reality of the gospel are you willing and able to release control to God where he is the measuring stick, you no longer are, and therefore you can freely love. Notice throughout all three of those radical neighborly love activities, I didn't ask a question. So here are the questions, which are interestingly enough, the same questions as last week. How does biblical love manifest itself in your everyday? How do you see it as you interact with real people, with real lives, living out their real stories? Is your spiritual giftedness an overflow of love? Does love motivate your sacrifices? Does love trump your intellect? All of those should ring a bell that the same questions as last week, but now we have more context. Now we have more weight to really allow ourselves to sink into the reality of what those questions are asking. You see, the type of love that Jesus is explaining in this parable was exhibited by the Samaritan that's not a natural human love. Jesus' whole point was to go and live like what? Loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then loving your neighbor as yourself. You cannot love your neighbor unless you love God. So what does it mean for us as the church to love God? What does it mean for you as an individual to love God? Well, the Bible talks about four different kinds of love. We're not going to get super deep into this. I'm going to throw this out to you just so that you see it. And what I want you to see about God love versus culture warping and twisting and rotting what God had in store through these definitions, I want you to see how both are at play when we're interacting in real life. The first one is the most awkward, eros. It's the romantic love. It's the love that's shared between a husband and a wife. But as we engage in this, this form of biblical love that's described throughout the Bible, especially in Song of Solomon and in other places, Ephesians 5, when we begin to talk about this love, this kind of love is pure. This kind of love is beautiful. This kind of love is an act of worship. But when we as a culture think about eros, we are so warped that we cannot experience the beauty that God created because of the sinfulness of humanity. What God intended to be sacrificial and covenant, our culture has warped into selfish and indulgent. So what, what must we do to reclaim that love? We must be founded and changed, justified and reconciled and sanctified through the presence of Jesus in our life. If we want to experience the type of love that is described as eros in scripture, we have to be founded on the love that God offers us. The next definition of love that we find in the Bible is this. It's called storge, is how it's pronounced. It's family affection. Family affection affection. It's the way I love my kids. It's the way I love my mom. It's the way I engage with, even though I'm not like my um, in-laws at all, it's the way I love them. There's a family connection. It's storge type of love. But you see, the, the world and culture has twisted that as well. Families have become corrupt and not safe. And when you think about love that should, be, that should be experienced in a family, we often think about foster children and orphanages and all kinds of other things, abuse and neglect and, and, and. Not God's intention for love. The third love is phileia. It's the friendship kind of love. It's the love that says, hey, you and I go through life together. We share life with each other. We pick each other up when we fall and we hold each other when we're down and we encourage one another. And what does it mean for us as a church and for individuals to experience this type of biblical love? It's the type of love that David had with Joshua. And yet the world tries to... to to change that and say somehow that they had a romantic relationship because they don't understand friendship, love. Jonathan, not Joshua, sorry. David and Jonathan. 
all you biblical scholars out there, you're like, that's the wrong name. I corrected myself. Like, so as you think through that, think through that love. What does it mean to have a friend? A friend that you can care for, a friend that cares for you. What does it mean to engage in radical neighborly sort of love that is that type of friendship? The fourth is agape. Agape is the one that sometimes just by nature is the most difficult, but at other times it's not that difficult. It's the sacrificial type of love. It's the, you know, what's the song? I'll take a bullet for you, I'll, whatever the song is, right? It's that sacrificial love. <laughs> now you got it in your head and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you just did that, right? Um, so, so sacrificial love. Now to get that out of your mind, the most biblical illustration of sacrificial love is Jesus' death on the cross. What does it mean for us to deny self and tape up, take up our cross and follow him? What does it mean to not see death as defeat, but death as victory? What does it mean for us to not be so enthralled or engaged or connected to this world that we can't see the beauty of the eternal? That's what agape love does for us. And as you think about these four types of love, I want you to think about this radical neighborly love. God has brought you to Second Mile for a reason. There's all kinds of reasons, but you're here. And I firmly believe that he has brought you here because he wants us together to engage in this sort of radical neighborly love. The first place that we truly believe it's going to happen is within the context of community groups. You're not going to get to know someone in this room for an hour and a half. You're just not going to. And so what we want you to do is to get engaged in a smaller group of people where you can begin to understand this sort of love. That there's the sacrificial love happening. There's the familial love happening. There's the friendship love happening. And maybe the Eros love obviously doesn't happen during the community group. But guess what? I've done a lot of weddings over the last two years. So it happens in community a lot. And we're happy for it. Right? It's the movement of what God is doing with people who join him on his mission. So if you're not involved in a community group, get involved in a community group. And more importantly, and this is where I want us, and I don't have the answers, but I just want you to think through this. If we are going to be radical neighbors, then what does it look like for you as a community group to begin to see that you have a radar happening around this house that you meet in every week that is radiating light? And do people in that neighborhood see that light? How can they see the light? Are you engaging for God's glory? Are you engaging sacrificially? Are you engaging in whatever God is asking you? And I'm not saying, well, in order for you to engage, you have to do this, 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 and this. I don't know, because your neighborhood's different, because where you meet is different. I don't have all the answers, but I know that you as a group of people need to be asking those questions, because if light shines light on darkness, is the neighborhood in which you meet week after week after week after week experiencing light. What does it mean to share the gospel, to live out the gospel, to proclaim the gospel? I know you're not just involved in community groups, which is the next sphere of influence. It's your vocational identity. You guys work. You guys are professionals. You guys are involved in lives all over the city in all sorts of vocations. And it might be school is your vocation at this time. But as you think about your vocation, what is God doing to shine a light through your presence in that environment? Do you have coworkers over? Do you hang out? Do you engage in arenas where you can have good conversations? Again, I don't have all the answers for how you will engage in those things, but I do know that the majority of you spend the majority of your time with the people that you work with. And so what does it mean to be a person who naturally shares their faith as an overflow of the gospel? Now, 
that's not the only place. You can take vocational identity and you can talk about the stay-at-home moms and you can talk about their neighborhoods and how they can influence that neighborhood. You can talk about those who are retired and what does it look like for you to be in that stage of life and what does it look like for you to engage in those specific things. You can talk about all kinds of other little areas that you find yourself in, your hobbies, your gym, your whatever, but what does it mean for you to purposely engage in those environments? The last one is this right here. For 10 years, Second Mile prayed that God would allow us to meet in this facility. It wasn't like we were devoted every day to pray for this building. When we first moved to Tucson and we saw the location of this place that is the direct geographical center of Tucson, and we said we want to be a church of Midtown, we want to be a place that radiates light throughout the city, and wouldn't it be great if we were in the center of it, we just, with a hope, with a wow, wouldn't it be cool? And here we are 10 years later and we're meeting in this facility. Why? What is God doing? I don't have all the answers, but I know that the Easter thing that we can serve a local elementary school, we can engage with 5,000 Easter eggs and make kids totally bloated on candy, that, that the point is not that, but the point is radical neighbor love. Hey, we're here. We're in the neighborhood. We care about the neighborhood. I want to share a brief story, and it's kind of hard because it's incriminating, and I'm not going to give away places, and if you ask me later, I'm not going to tell you what it was, but I was in this conversation, and it was about a certain church in a certain neighborhood, and I was talking to the person, the neighborhood association of that neighborhood, and this this person in the neighborhood association knew the full history of this church, like better than most people would know about this church. And we were asking this person in this neighborhood association questions about how could the church help? How could people of faith help? And he said, honestly, and then he named this church, we have not experienced a good idea of that. And this there was a lot of details that if I talked about it, would give it away, so I'm not going to give it away. But this was the end of the story. The end of the story is those people come and they meet for an hour or two hours or three hours over the weekend and then they go away. They don't care about this neighborhood. They take our parking, they take our resources, they take all kinds of things, but they don't care. Is that the message that we need to be sending. And the funny thing is, I know some of those people, those, those churches and that church specifically, that is not their intent. If you sat down across the table, they love Jesus, they wanna honor Jesus, they would say they wanna serve their community. We would say those same things, but are we? Are we invested in the neighborhood? I honestly, I mean of all the answers, I do not know what that means for us here at Emmanuel Baptist Church, what it means for us in this location, on this street, surrounded by these people. But I know it means something. So what does it mean for us to radically love those around us? The last questions for the evening are these. How will you be a biblical Neighbor. You know, for many of us, we need time to think about that question. So here's the statement. Take time this week to specifically make plans to engage with those God has put into your proximity of influence. Take the time. Be specific, be vulnerable, be aware of your surroundings. Pray that God would open your eyes to the world that he sees when he walks with you every moment of your day. What does he reveal to you? Take the time, take the risk. Love your neighbor through glorifying God, love your neighbor, th neighbor through sacrificially serving. Love your neighbor because you fully love God. How will you influence others 
within Second Mile to join you. Now we're not just talking personally, we're talking about the people that are sitting next to you. The people that you go to community group with, the people that you go grocery shopping with, the people that you engage with, how are we collectively going to do this thing together? Right now, ask yourself this question, who has God put in your life that needs to hear the truth of Jesus? I guarantee there's someone. You may not like who just came to mind, but there's someone. Who has God put in your life that needs to hear the truth of Jesus? And the last question, when are you going to take the risk and talk to them about Jesus, salvation, eternity, and hope? I heard Matt Chandler once talk about this story about his neighbors, and it it convicts me every time, and I disqualify people all the time because I look at my neighborhood, and I think about, well, that person's not interested, and that person is this, and that person is that, and I've had this conversation with that person, and so this is out of my own conviction. I am not above having to change my methods and my relationships because we're in this together. But what Matt Matt Chandler said is he has engaged with his neighborhood in such a way, and it's a different culture, and they're in a different time, different place of the country, and I get that. But basically, he talks about this experience where in this moment that he's engaging with the neighbor, the neighbor kind of says to him, okay, let's just get this over with. And and what what his neighbor was saying is, hey, Matt, I I know you. I know your reputation. At some point, you're going to share the gospel with me, so let's just do it now. On the initiative of the neighbor. And Matt's like, well, I'm glad you see it my way, and then began to share, right? (laughs) As you think through just that reality. I mean, what if? Not that we're weird just for the sake of being weird. Not that we're misfits. Not that our community would avoid us. No. There, there are people that go door to door that talk about their method of finding God. And guess what? Our house is no longer on their route. Like, I don't know if they mark us. They don't go to that. He's a pastor. But they don't come to our house. They come to our cul-de-sac, but they don't come to our house. You don't want to be that person in your neighborhood. Don't talk to that house. So you want to serve and you want to engage and you want to have a relationship, but you want to be so good at the relationship because you truly love them that they're ready to listen even if they don't agree with everything you have to say. Let's be a church that radically displays neighborly love. Let's take this story of the Good Samaritan and let's not just make it an academic, theoretical, man, Jesus was a good storyteller. And let's make it the reality of everyone of our lives.